Breaking news from WRAL. Coverage you can count on. Breaking news, a construction worker is dead after being struck by two vehicles on I-40. What he was doing moments before he was struck. Wake County parents will hear more today about an app students will be encouraged to use to improve school safety. What we know about the district's plan to improve school safety right from your student's pocket. Interest rate cuts could be on the horizon. Michelle McConaughey is in the WRL Live Center with what Fed Chair Jerome Powell had to say at a Fed's annual retreat. We're following some breaking news this noon hour, we now know the name of the maintenance worker who died this morning on I-40. Good afternoon, I'm Ken Smith. And I'm Renee Chu. Thanks for joining us. We've also learned that the worker was hit by two vehicles at the scene. WRO's Chelsea Donovan joins us live near the scene along I-40 East to explain what we've learned. Chelsea. Yeah, the scene is now clear here, but as you mentioned, we now know the name of that construction worker who was killed right here in this area of I-40 uh, near the 70 split, and that is 45-year-old Kavaris Bowens of Lumberton. Now, this is video of the crash that snarled traffic for hours uh, near I-40 and 70 split. The Highway Patrol says Bowens, who was employed by Stay Alert Safety Services, that is affiliated with S.T. Wooten, who's doing construction here was standing in the median removing a lane closure sign that was warning drivers of an upcoming work zone. Now authorities say he had on a reflective vest and his car had his warning lights activated. Authorities say Bowens attempted to cross the eastbound lanes of 40 to return to the shoulder. He was struck by a driver and was thrown to the pavement and now we know a second vehicle struck him again and he died at the scene. Now we should mention in speaking with the state highway patrol that speed or impairment was not a factor in this incident. And thus right now, no charges are being filed against those two drivers that struck Bowens. However, this is still an active investigation. Live in Garner, Chelsea Donovan, WRL News. Friends and family of Carrie Massenberg and her six-year-old daughter showed their respects during a balloon release last night. The visitation begins at 6 tonight. Investigators say they were killed by Kiera's boyfriend, Zoe's father. Nearly two weeks ago, authorities say Daquan Jones shot Kiera and Zoe before turning the gun on himself. Jones left jail only a day before on assault charges. Court records show there was a pattern of domestic violence in the couple's relationship. It was definitely red flags. You know, we all have reached out and tried to help her. She was really scared. And it was just, you know, it was just something that she was really, she was trying to get away from it. Well, as they grieve the loss of Kiera and Zoe, loved ones have a message. Look for signs of abuse. The funeral for the mother and daughter happening tomorrow morning. Wake County students and families have a new way to anonymously report concerns to their school administrators and counselors. It's called the Say Something app. WRL's Destiny Patterson is live in Fuquay Verena at Herbert Aikens Road Middle School. And Destiny, you spoke with school officials about the importance of this new app. <laughs> That's right, Renee. Middle schools, or rather year-round schools like this middle school that I'm standing in front of here, they've been implementing it and using it for the past month. I want to show you how it works. Take a look. So you will input your location, which school you're at, and then there are all these options to choose from. So if we select one, then you can actually put in all of this information here, fill it out, and then school administrators are notified. The principal here tells me that they've had about 12 tips so far just within the last month. Those tips have ranged from things like bullying, threats to oneself as well as others, and other categories as well. In addition to this new app, the school system is still using its existing tip line, and it also... District officials say that the system not only acts as a way to learn about things that may happen on campus, but it also teaches students to identify signs of at-risk behavior as well. One of the things we want to do with students through this process is educate them, number one, about what are the signs, what are the things to look for in themselves and their peers, right? That's important. So that education and awareness piece is important. Then we also want to make sure that to know for them to know who are the people I can trust, who are the trusted adults, so I can share these concerns. 
Thousands of school districts across the country have already started using this system. Here in Wake County, as I mentioned, year-round schools have already started using this. Now, when it comes to the traditional schools, then they'll start their onboarding next month and get that implemented throughout the year. And then fourth and fifth graders, they're still figuring out when they will get them started with this new program. Destiny Patterson, WRL News, Wake County. Over the last week, WRL asked you to give us your thoughts about the next state superintendent of public instruction. Republican Michelle Morrow and Democrat Mo Green are vying for the job to oversee children's public education. We wanted to know what qualities you think are most important in whoever gets the job and what issues you think are top priority. Tonight at 7 on WRL, we are bringing you the results of our unscientific survey. You'll be able to see more details online shortly after the story airs. And happening right now in the WRL Life Center, the Federal Reserve is expected to announce interest rate cuts very soon. Uh, this says new data, as data spears, uh, fears, uh, Sparks fear the economy could soon enter a recession. Fed, Chom, Jero, Fed Chair Jerome Powell is in Wyoming right now. He said the time has come for policy to adjust. He also went on to outline what led to these higher inflation rates in the first place. He said that there is li much to be learned from this episode, saying inflation brought substantial hardship, especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of living. My confidence has grown that inflation is on a a sustainable path back to that 2% the Federal Reserve meets next month. And following that news, Michelle, stocks are rallying this noon hour. The Dow Jones up more than 260 points. The, the S&P also in the green this morning, plus more than 34 points. Uh, the Nasdaq, though, in the red this noon hour. The party's over and the cleanup is in full swing. Last night, 100,000 red, white, and blue balloons filled the United Center in Chicago as the DNC wrapped up. Vice President Kamala Harris hopes to harness the momentum her campaign created this week and to keep it up through Election Day. NBC's Alice Barr is at the United Center with a final recap on a historic night. Hi there. The four-day Democratic National Convention really brought the energy in a campaign transformed by Vice President Kamala Harris's move to the top of the ticket. Throughout this week here in Chicago, she leaned into joy and to what her campaign described as a deep and abiding sense of patriotism as she's trying to send the message to Americans that she is the candidate they can trust, as she said last night, that she would be a president for all Americans. She also tried to answer some of the questions about where she stands on key policy issues. She talked about bringing back the bipartisan immigration bill that former President Trump had opposed. She talked about protecting reproductive rights and about introducing tax cuts for the middle class. And then she delved into her personal story, talking about growing up as the child of Jamaican and Indian immigrants, the influence that her mother had and urging her to seek justice and her career from prosecutor to senator to vice president. And now the first woman of color to lead a major party ticket. The next big mile marker to watch for coming up next month, Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Trump squaring off in their first debate. In Chicago, I'm Alice Barr, NBC News. New details this noon in the assassination attempt on Donald Trump and the security failures that may have led to that very close call. Multiple Secret Service agents have been put on leave for their actions leading up to the incident. Those on leave include the head of the Pittsburgh office, who was responsible for coordinating the security plan. This follows word that officers in Pennsylvania set aside radios to communicate with the Secret Service before the July 13th rally, but the Secret Service never picked them up. The district attorney says if they had, they likely would have heard a warning about a man on the roof before he fired at the former president. One man was killed, two others were wounded, and Trump's right ear was hurt. 
One of the former Memphis, Tennessee police, Tennessee police officers charged in the death of Tyree Nichols is expected to change his plea to guilty today. Emmett Martin accepted a deal with prosecutors. He's one of five former officers who were charged with second-degree murder, aggravated kidnapping, assault, and official misconduct. This was in the case of Nichols' death that happened after a brutal arrest during a traffic stop last year. Martin will be the second of the group to take the plea deal. A federal trial for the other three is scheduled to start September 9th. Two Louisville police officers who worked on the search warrant in the deadly Breonna Taylor raid will not face federal charges. The 26-year-old was shot and killed in her apartment by officers back in 2020. Detective Joshua Jaynes and Sergeant Kyle Meany were charged two years later with submitting a false affidavit search on the home. On Thursday, a judge ruled there was no direct link between the warrantless entry and Taylor's death. Instead, the judge found the decision by Taylor's boyfriend to fire his gun when officers burst into the home as the legal cause of Taylor's death. Next at noon, the final body recovered from that super yacht that sank off the coast of Sicily. What's next in the investigation? Also, new video and eyewitness accounts of a man who walked onto the wing of an aircraft. It's video you must see to believe. Plus, the data showing the downside of sports betting that was legalized in our state earlier this year. And a very comfortable afternoon here on the patio. Our dew point remains in the 50s in the comfy zone, but I'll show you which day over the weekend it starts to climb. Keep watching WRAL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257. Crews have recovered the body of the last person missing from a super yacht that sank off the coast of Sicily. We are waiting final confirmation, but the victim is believed to be the daughter of a British tech magnet. NBC's Claudio Lavagna reports from Sicily. The Italian Coast Guard says it has recovered the seventh and final body missing after the Bayesian super yacht sank in waters just behind me earlier this week. Now divers have just returned to the shore after searching the sunken vessel, uh, transferring the body into a waiting ambulance. The body is understood to be Hannah Lynch, the 18-year-old daughter of British entrepreneur and tech tycoon Mike Lynch, who was among the other people killed in a tragic accident. Now an investigation continues into the supposedly unsinkable luxury super yacht, which, according to survivors, sank in a matter of minutes during a freak storm half a mile off Sicily's coast on Monday morning here. Now, questions are being asked as another yacht anchored nearby did not suffer the same fate, and the ship's designer told Italian media that, that he believes the incident could have been caused by human error. On Wednesday, prosecutors here questioned the captain of the yacht, who is among the survivors, for two hours to understand what exactly happened and if anything could have been done to prevent this tragedy. Now, the prosecutor in charge of the investigation is expected to hold a press conference here in Sicily on Saturday morning. And that was Claudio Lavagna reporting. Well, back stateside, authorities in South Florida are searching for an escaped detainee. U.S. Immigration Customs Enforcement officials say the person escaped Wednesday evening from an immigration detention center in southwest Miami. The search prompted a nearby school to go on lockdown. A large-scale search operation is underway, but officials have not released any details about the person or why that person was being held. Well, today, people in and around Cumberland County may hear what sounds like gunfire or loud explosions. It's related to the Army's Special Forces training. It's the final stage of training before troops can join the Army's elite Green Berets. The training lasts several days and takes place across several different counties, including Wake. The training will continue through September 5th. Tomorrow, NASA is expected to announce a decision about when and how they plan to bring two astronauts stuck in space back to Earth. Butch Woolmore and Sonny Williams traveled to the International Space Station aboard a Boeing Starliner in June. The spacecraft took the two as a test for routine flights, but the Starliner sprang leaks and some thrusters failed. Now NASA must decide if it is safe to bring them back now or if SpaceX could retrieve them.
New video into our newsroom shows the bizarre scene at the airport in Melbourne, Australia yesterday. We first told you about the man who walked out onto the wing of an airplane on the tarmac on our new newscast yesterday. Witnesses to say the man had been vaping during that 90 minute flight, which is not allowed. Cell phone video shows the man after he opened the emergency exit and then started to walk on the wing of the plane. Several passengers tried to stop him, but he was able to push his way through. Airport workers quickly spotted the man and held him in place until police got there. I want to turn our attention now to this beautiful, uh, I almost said fall day because it feels like fall outside. Let's get out to meteorologist Elizabeth Gardner out on the WRO weather patio. Great place to be this noon hour, Elizabeth. Hey, Ken, if you speak it, it comes to be, right? Right, so we can keep just saying it's fall, it's fall, it's fall. You know, technically, the first of September is meteorological fall because we tend to, you know, really start seeing those fall changes happening in the month of September weather-wise. But, you know, officially on the calendar, we have about a month or so left. we we'll take a live look at the gardens. Absolutely beautiful. And you can see down there on the pad, we have some lights and a camera, a little bit of a surprise coming for you a little later on in the new cast. Uh, other than that, it's pretty quiet here. Absolutely beautiful, though. We have some high thin clouds. We have a front that's hanging out uh, along the coast that's been sending more clouds today than we saw yesterday. 78 degrees, which is a comfortable temperature, and our dew point remains in the 50s. The dew point, again, is the measure of moisture in the atmosphere, and when it's in the 50s this time of year, it tends to feel very comfortable. Now, next week, it'll climb into the 70s, and it'll feel oppressive and muggy and, and just uncomfortable again. That'll happen starting around Tuesday. Tuesday. But it's a beautiful afternoon out here, certainly 73 in Roxborough, 76 Southern Pine, 78 Raleigh, 75 South Hill. It just feels great. There's a, a teeny bit of a light breeze. It's just delightful. You just want to pull up a chair and uh, kick back and uh, have, a, have a glass of iced tea. Visible satellite showing those cloud cover, those, those clouds that I'm seeing right above me here on the patio. Um, it's just some high, high cloud cover. A little closer to the I-95 corridor, we're seeing those clouds a little bit thicker. And this is likely to stick with us for the next few hours. Now we get into the evening and all these clouds should start to pull away and we'll see more sunshine over the weekend. I'm going to show you that boundary. It's causing those clouds coming up. But a nice afternoon, 82 in Raleigh, 81 in Durham, and 83 in Fayetteville for our high temperatures today. And uh, our mugginess will stay uh, on the low side for the next day or two. 88 is our normal high, so 82 today, but then 85 tomorrow and 88 on Sunday. So we start to creep up closer to normal. And then it's just hot for Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday, Thursday, and really right on into the holiday weekend next weekend. 68 is our normal low. It's going to be nice and cool tomorrow. This is pretty significant. I'm one of those people who likes to get out early on Saturday for a run. I cannot wait for this tomorrow. 59 will be the dew point. And even Sunday looks good. 61 should be comfortable as you're heading out the door Sunday morning. But then 72 on Wednesday. Eek! Um, that's going to feel just like July again. Here's the reason that we're seeing these pleasant conditions. Notice the blue Blue lines there. Those are the arrows. That's where the wind is coming from. So our wind direction is uh, out of the northeast. That's all coming from Canada, kind of off the uh, off the ocean, if you will. And it stays that way sort of through the weekend. But we really start to get a bigger push coming from the east. And then eventually Tuesday, it all starts to come out of the south. See how it turns red there? And that's going to be that flow out of the south. Here's what that does for us. We're going to see that dew point really uh, climbing to steamy on Monday and Tuesday. So big changes coming. Uh, but that doesn't happen until early next week. And in the meantime, you can get outside and enjoy uh, whatever is happening that you had planned over the weekend. We're looking at, uh, of course, our weekend temperature is starting to warm up up just a little bit, but the heat is on for the middle of next week. How about the tropics? They're not heating up as much. I'll show you why. Elizabeth, thanks. High school football teams kick off their season tonight. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can't make it to your school's game, there may be a way to stream it online or watch it online. Today at four, though, five on your side's Killy Arthur has warnings. And tonight at 6, WRL investigates your county spending on education. Which districts spend the most and least on your child's education? Well, the news continues now. Getting money out of an ATM can cost you a pretty penny, depending on which machine you use, the record fee after the break. Plus, if you own a pet, you know they love to eat what we eat whenever they can. But it could be a recipe for disaster. We'll share a list of foods that could be harmful to pets.
The cost of using ATMs outside your bank network reached a new high average. The average fee for using out-of-network ATMs is now $4.77 per use. Your bank charges a buck 58 for using the out-of-network ATM, while the owner of that machine charges an average of $3.19. There's a little bit of good news. The survey found overdraft fees fell to less than $27. Some people love to give their fur babies human food as a treat. And while certain foods are actually good for their health, some can make them very sick or even put their lives in danger. Grapes, raisins, and nuts are toxic because they can cause kidney damage. Chocolate, cocoa powder, and caffeine can overstimulate their nervous system and heart. And spices like onions, garlic, and sugar can lead to seizures or death. Talk to your vet about other foods that could be safe, unsafe. If you notice your pet is acting abnormally and showing any signs of illness, contact your veterinarian immediately. Well, if you buy used Peloton equipment, your bank account may get a little more than a workout as well. The fitness company says it will charge a one-time $95 used equipment activation fee. The fees will apply to buyers who purchase outside of Peloton and its official distribution partners in the U.S. and Canada. The fee takes away some of the savings people have been enjoying by opting for a second-hand Peloton. Well, Amazon is bringing back big deals and free delivery with a new event, Prime Big Deal Days, arriving in October. The goal is to give members special deals leading up to the holidays. The e-commerce site says it's just one way to help members save time and money. The deals may be similar to those offered in July for Prime Day, but the company has yet to announce any additional details. Instagram is giving users a new way to express themselves through music. You can now add your favorite song to your profile. It's simple. Just go to your account. Click Edit Profile, scroll down until you see the new music option in the list, then select any track from Instagram's library. You can share up to 30 seconds of a song on each profile. To change or remove the song, go back into Edit Profile and then tap on the song. Well, let's want to share with you in the next half hour. It's been five months since online sports gambling became legal in our state. Some have heeded calls to wager safely while others have not. Coming up, we'll examine new data. Plus, if you watch day four of the DNC, you probably noticed a lot of women wearing white. We'll share the significance of the color choice in our next half hour. First, here's a look at the winning lottery numbers. Shot in 4K ultra high definition. Your number one source for local news. WRAL News. Coverage you can count on. People in North Carolina are calling the state's problem gambling helpline at record numbers. You know, of course, sports betting became legal in our state this year, and since then, the numbers have been increasing. WRAL's Noah Klein is here now with what the data shows and some of the other numbers we're seeing from sports betting, Noah. Ken, legal online sports gambling started in the state back on March 11th. Since then, people have bet more than $2.5 billion. The gambling helpline, meanwhile, has set records for monthly calls in April, May, and June. This is all according to data obtained by WRL sports investigative reporter Brian Murphy. It goes back to 2010. This new data it shows in March, the number of calls to the hotline were nearly double what they were last year. If the trends continue, North Carolina will set an annual record. In almost every state where we've expanded gambling, especially in terms of sports wagering and or iGaming, we've seen a rapid growth in the number of calls going to their hotlines. You know, part of that increase, it could be coming from awareness. Gambling companies are required to display that helpline number on apps and advertisements. People who call the helpline do have access to free therapy for gambling. If you or someone you know is struggling with it, we have the phone number, the text line, and the website to get help. That's all posted over on WRAL.com. 
And happening right now in the WREL Life Center, an arrest has been made in a 2023 homicide in Durham. An 18-year-old has been charged with the murder of Daquan Scott. This is Scott here. This happened on October 4th of last year. Officers found Scott, who had been shot on Ridgeway Avenue in Durham. He was transported to Duke University Hospital, where he died. Now, the 18-year-old, who is a juvenile at the time of the incident, has been charged with first-degree murder via juvenile petition. His name, they are not released at this time. He is in secure custody right now. Michelle, thanks. Day four of the DNC came to a historic end with the party nominating Vice President Kamala Harris as our first woman of color to be president. You might have noticed several women from lawmakers to speakers and delegates who wore white. The color represents women's suffrage, the movement that culminated with women getting the right to vote in 1920. One attendee says it was an important gesture to remember the people who fought hard for this moment. What's special to me about this moment is the fact that it shows that in America, your dreams really can come true. No matter where you come from, what you look like, what your circumstances are, that you can really strive to, to be at the top. Um, and so it gives a lot of us hope. Women have worn white to other consequential political events, especially those who are considered Moments women broke through the glass ceiling. Vice President Harris wore white when she delivered her first speech as vice president-elect after winning the 2020 election. Only on WREL, we talked to Shaw University's president about Vice President Kamala Harris's historic candidacy. Back in 2020, Dr. Paula Dillard hosted then-Senator Harris at the historically black university. Harris, an HBCU alumna herself, a graduate of Howard University. Dillard says this school year, the energy for Harris is already palpable, especially with young women. If there is hope, the possibilities are you know, unlimited. And so I'm just excited about the positive dialogue and narrative um, and the discussions that are more about possibilities and less about separation and negativity. Well, Dillard also believes Harris can empathize with HBCUs facing financial struggles. In a partial win for Republicans, proof of citizenship will be required for new Arizona voters in certain circumstances. However, voters who cannot document their citizenship status will still be allowed to register using a federal form. Arizona is a critically important battleground state in the presidential election. President Joe Biden carried the state by just over 10,000 vo votes in 2020. Former President Trump won it in 2016. Donald Trump's businesses are raking in millions of dollars from Republican political campaigns. In the first half of this year, federal campaigns and PACs have spent nearly $3.2 million on Trump businesses. Most of that going to a Trump-owned company that operates his jet, Mar-a-Lago fundraisers, and stays at Trump's hotels. Well, today, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. will address the nation from Phoenix, Arizona. Yesterday, he withdrew from the state's ballot. Speculation has been growing. Kennedy could drop his independent presidential bid and endorse former President Trump. His campaign says he plans to speak about his path forward. Hours later, Trump will hold a rally in nearby Glendale. Trump's campaign says he will be joined by a, quote, special guest at that event. Neither campaign said whether Kennedy will be that special guest. A lawsuit claims a man who drove to Raleigh from New Mexico to find a woman he met online tried to kill her. The lawsuit says he knew where to find her because Verizon gave him her phone records name and address. Federal prosecutors say Robert Glauner posed as a Cary police officer and gave Verizon a fake search warrant to get the records. Authorities say he met the woman online and stalked her. She blocked his phone and even changed her number. Authorities say that's when Glauner drove across country and showed up at her home with rope and a knife. High school football is back starting tonight, and security is a big concern for schools. A brawl broke out at last weekend's high school OT Jamboree. Four games were scheduled to be played at Wake Forest High, but an incident in the crowd had the stadium evacuated during the second game. Wake County school events already have security guidelines, including a clear bag policy. Things like diaper bags, small clutch-sized wallets, and medically necessary items like oxygen tanks are still allowed. 
Starting tonight, Football Friday is back for its 44th season. We'll have highlights from about 25 high school football games all across our area, plus some of the best sports reporters in the state. See if your touchdown is shown tonight at 1135 on WRL. Heroic efforts by firefighters in Nevada to save a newborn who stopped breathing. How the mother says her baby wouldn't be alive if it weren't for them. And later, good work from rescuers trying to help a whale caught up in fishing lines wrapped around its tail. How they were able to calm the animal down to get close enough to help. Take WRL with you on the go. Download the WRL News app for breaking news updates, live Doppler images, and our live newscast right on your phone. Welcome back. This is a live look at Pinehurst and look at that beautiful weather. No doubt the golf courses will be busy today. It will feel so nice to do anything outdoors. You're watching WRL News available on YouTube TV and the WRL app on your TV or streaming device. A Nevada family reunited with the firefighters who saved their newborn's life. Baby Grace was born at home back in June prematurely and went into cardiac arrest. A team of firefighters who responded to that 911 call performed CPR and a list of other procedures to save the baby. And fortunately, they were able to bring Grace's heart rate up. She would be dead if, if they didn't do what they did. Like that was kind of where I was at. Like we were giving her CPR and trying to take care of her and like holding her child in your arms as she turned blue. Like I was mentally preparing for her to die and then they showed up and brought her back. Grace spent two weeks in the hospital and is fully recovered. Each firefighter who responded was given a special award yesterday. Oh, you just love that story. Well, this weekend, hundreds of female motorcycle riders will make their way to Raleigh. Tobacco Road Holly Davidson hosting the 2024 All-Female Ride. This is video from last year's event in Fayetteville. The main event gets started tomorrow with a police-escorted ride through Raleigh. Then the women will head back to Harley Davidson for a street party with a DJ, line dance, raffles and a whole lot of fun. Well, the first year of college life can be tough for students and parents alike. School administrators share a few things caregivers can do to help them adjust. And it's a real life free willy how rescuers were able to help a humpback whale resume migrating. You know, when children head off to college, some parents can have a difficult time letting go, but there are ways parents can help young adults make a successful transition to college. Kevin Uretsky spoke with academic experts about the do's and don'ts. Parenting children is no easy task. Even when they grow up and head to college, many still need some guidance from their guardians. But academic experts say there's a fine line parents shouldn't cross when it comes to helping students transition into their freshman year. For the first six weeks of college, if they have a residential student on campus, they really should not bring their student home and they should really avoid visiting if they can. That first six weeks is the critical time for a student to meet people and start engaging in the life of the campus and they just can't do it with a parent who's hovering. According to Dr. Sarah Klein, Vice President for Student Affairs at the Stevens Institute of Technology, college freshmen need to get used to making their own decisions. I think that the best thing a parent can do is be a great listener to their student and let their student direct the process on pretty much everything. The student, once they enroll at a university and make a decision, it really needs to be them as the person making all the decisions. But for parents who find it hard to stop worrying about if their child is making the right choices, Dr. Klein says this is the perfect time for them to make mistakes. You have a safety net of college and all the resources there, and you can make mistakes, and it's not as horrible as when you make mistakes in the real world because we're all there to help them pick up the pieces. And that was Kevin Uretsky reporting. Now, for parents whose kids might call them feeling homesick, picking them up for a weekend away from campus is not recommended. Counselors say it only deepens the feelings and makes students want to stay home. Well, it's so nice out there. Uh, Renee decided, uh, well, let me check out the WRL Azalea Gardens, which we invite you to come down and visit sometime. And Renee, I don't blame you one bit. 
Ken, you know, I so enjoy working alongside you in the studio, but I had to break free out of the air-conditioned studio, right, and take my own advice of telling people when it's this nice, you got to get outdoors. And so, yeah, I find myself in the WRL Gardens right here in our backyard where we just have beautiful blooms. Any time of year, you see some um, gorgeous plants here and just a wonderful way to enjoy this nice weather. And, yes, you can visit the WRL Gardens anytime from dawn to dusk and right here in our backyard. Elizabeth Gardner is also enjoying the gardens from another vantage point. And Elizabeth, it feels so refreshing out here. It does. You know, this is the payback from all those times I had to stand here on the patio and just sweat to death. <laughs> it's great. But I, I see you take this opportunity, you know, and it feels nice to get out here, Renee, and uh, not when it's uh, hot. <clears throat> hey, Renee, give a wave if you can hear me. <laughs> I guess she can't hear me now. <laughs> you can see her right back there. Uh, that's where she was standing on the uh, on a little patio that's down in the garden. So we're just having a little bit of fun out here today. There is a little bit more cloud cover this morning or, or this afternoon than there was yesterday. And you can see that there's a boundary that's sitting offshore and that boundary is allowing some of that cloud cover to slide on inland. It's not likely to last all day. We're going to see that pulling away as we get it uh, through mid to late afternoon. And uh, we should see a bit more sunshine really from the triangle area westward we're going to be more more sunny and then the farther east you go the more cloud cover we'll end up seeing the blue shaded area is where temperatures are below normal but here comes the heat we've been talking about it for the last day or two that this was not here to stay even though we are right on september's door we've got a little more summer weather that we'll have to deal with before it's here full time so you can see high pressure builds in as we get into the early part of next week and that is going to bump up our temperature and our humidity too but it's a lovely afternoon that's in our forecast temperatures will be in the low to mid 80s for this afternoon. It is uh, football Friday, the first one of the season. And gosh, it's it's going to be lovely temperatures at around six o'clock, 80 degrees, 74, 75 at around eight o'clock and then on down into the 60s. So you know, if you are planning to head out to a football game, maybe in uh, short sleeves, you might want to take your favorite team sweatshirt. You might need it toward the end of the game. Overnight tonight, it's cool again. We drop back into the mid 50s in the north and low 60s in the south. That's going to make for some lovely conditions for Saturday morning. Saturday also also stays comfy, but by Sunday we creep to tolerable and by Tuesday we're back to humid. So that muggy meter is definitely climbing and you may say, well, just when are we done with this? So here is sort of a guideline. This is the average number of days that we see tropical, which is the highest level. So that's going to be dew points in the 70s. And in July, it's 24 days and August is 22 days. So it's I mean, it's a bunch of the month for those two. But then in September, it's only 11 days. So we see half as many days in September as we do in August that has that really high humidity. So yeah, we're coming along and we hardly see any of it, any of it in October. So uh, relief is coming. We're going to see more days like this um, just in a few weeks. Uh, Lazy Days Festival happening over the weekend. It's going to feel great Saturday. Humidity stays low. Temperatures will be in the low to mid 80s. On Sunday, a little hotter. We'll climb into the upper 80s in the afternoon and we start to move, you know, toward tolerable with the uh, humidity. Once we get into that hot zone by Tuesday and Wednesday, it's going to stay that way at least through the first week of September. And that does include, of course, the Labor Day holiday. And maybe that's OK with you. I mean, a lot of people, Labor Day holiday, like to get out and uh, head to the pool, to the lake, to the beach and all that. And it'll definitely be hot enough for that. We'll also be dry through Tuesday. The next best chance of rain doesn't come until next Friday, which is a week from today. But that is the beginning of the Labor Day holiday. And we're going to be watching for a wetter pattern at that point. Our tropical outlook is nice and quiet. Uh, no additional development in the next week or so. But after that, we'll have about a 40 to 60 percent chance of some development out there in the Atlantic. It is that time of year, certainly. So we go from lovely weather the next few days to really oppressively hot again Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. Hope you're ready. We are ready. Thanks, Elizabeth. Well, new this noon hour, a volcano in Iceland erupting for the sixth time this December, since December. Officials say the lava is not flowing, though, toward the town of Grindavik. Most of the nearly 4,000 people who live there have been evacuated from the town since November because of that volcanic activity. A marathon effort to free a humpback whale ends in triumph. Where this happened and how crews were able to get the juvenile on its way. As we wrap things up, here's a look at a few of the headlines we're following today. 
Breaking news at noon. We now know the name of the maintenance worker who was killed this morning on I-40. We've also learned that the worker was hit by two vehicles at the scene. The Highway Patrol said the man is 45-year-old Caveras Bowens of Lumberton. Authorities say Bowens was standing in the median removing a lane closure sign that was warning drivers of an upcoming work zone. Wake County students and families have a new way to anonymously report concerns to their school administrators and counselors. It's called the Say Something app. In addition to this new app, the school system is still using their already existing tip line. The app has been in some schools in our state since 2019. Well, people in North Carolina are calling the state's problem gambling helpline at record numbers. Sports betting became legal early this year, and since then, the numbers have been increasing. The data from the helpline goes back to 2010. It shows in March the number of calls made were nearly double what they were last year. A young whale has resumed its trek along the Humpback Highway after being rescued from fishing debris. Crews spotted the whale yesterday in Sydney, Australia, one of the world's busiest harbors. Rescuers in rubber boats tried to slow down the energetic animal by attaching orange floats to increase its resistance through water. They had to wait patiently for the whale to get tired. Then, once rescuers got close enough, they used blades attached to poles to safely cut the fishing lines free. The whale took off swimming south out of the harbor and all ends well. A family in Connecticut had an unexpected visitor stop by this week. They were enjoying their day in the yard when suddenly a bear appears. Kristen Lee, whose ring camera captured this video, says her nine-year-old shot a bear and you see how everyone ran inside. The bear casually looked both ways before crossing the driveway and then just sauntered along. Oh, that nine-year-old was on point. Well, our pet of the day comes from the SBCA of Wake County. Daphne is a beautiful four-year-old spayed female long-haired cat. She was taken out to the shelter after she started acting up in her former home. The SBCA is hoping a change of scenery is just what the doctor ordered to help Daphne find her match. She's pretty independent and likes to do her own thing, so she's fairly low maintenance on the attention fund. Contact the SBCA of Wake County to meet Daphne. Hey, Daphne is beautiful. She should model. The SBCA of Wake County is also a part of our Clear the Shelters annual event. Serving over half of North Carolina's counties, SBCA Wake supports pets and people through vital community programs. During Clear the Shelters, visit their Raleigh headquarters to meet adoptable pets and support their life-saving work. For more information on adoption or to get involved, go to their website or stop by the shelter today. Well, coming up on WRO News at 4, there's a full slate of local high school football teams kicking off this season tonight. Five on your sides, Keely Arthur joins us at 4 with a warning to click carefully before streaming the games online. So, Ken, I was worried about you getting too lonely here in the studio, so I decided to come back for was, a little bit. I was almost making a help sign to help. <laughs> Let's have somebody help me finish the newscast. I wasn't sure she was coming back. So, you know, we're finishing it, and now we get to go back oh, outside. Love it. Big and enjoy the wonderful weather. <laughs> NBC News Daily is next on WRAL. Your next local news update in 30 minutes. Uh, you can get breaking news updates anytime on the WR News app. Have a great day and a great weekend. watching WRAL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257.